let's get to the word today. Today we want to look at uh, something that I've actually been researching, and I had to to spread some things out a little bit um, because there are just way too many references for what we're going to attack this morning, and that is Bible lists. One day, uh, many months ago, I decided just to kind of do a study in Scripture about all of the lists that are in the Bible, and there are just way too many lists. Well, there aren't way too many lists, otherwise wouldn't have been put in the Bible, but um, to, to put before you in one day. So I actually chose three of them, and I'm, we're going to look at these three lists today. So here are some scriptural lists, and the purpose of this is so that you and I may grow in godliness. I want to grow in the Lord. I want to continue to grow in the Lord. I am not a scholar. I'm a student. I'm, I'm, I'm someone who's always searching, hungry for more and more truth. I desire to know God better today than I did yesterday, better tomorrow than, uh, than what I've experienced today. So it's important if we're going to grow in godliness that we do the things that make for growth in our lives. So three lists today. We're going to go through these three lists. And the first one is this. If you're going to grow in godliness, number one, put on godly clothes. Get your clothes on. Get your clothes on. Every day when we wake up, one of the first things that we do is choose the wardrobe for the day. What are we going to wear for the day? And what we wear really is wholly dependent upon uh, what we're going to be doing on that particular day, what activity we're going to be involved in. So one of the things that I've noticed is everybody's wardrobe is different. Everybody's closet holds different things. Now, some of you, I mean, it's not a big deal to figure out what you're going to wear. Get a T-shirt out, get some jeans, throw on some sandals, and you're ready for the week. (laughs) Others of you stand before the closet and wonder, what did I wear last Sunday? What did I wear three days ago? Did I just wear these? Did these shoes go with this outfit? I mean, it really is something you have to ponder. What we wear, actually, are our choices, and those choices uh, are, are different. Um, I wanted to show you some of the choices I've made in my life uh, in terms of what I wear. <laughs> Yeah, come on. So, you, you know, just I wake up every morning and say, okay, what, do I, what am I feeling today? <laughs> Not really. Um, but, but we make choices about what we wear. How, now, listen, how we look, what we wear represents God and represents God to the world. And so I want to look at godly clothes that we are to put on. Let's begin in Colossians chapter 3 and look at our very first list. Let me read this first, starting at verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other, forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Verse 14 says, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Now, this passage was written to the church at Colossae. Chapter one, verse two of Colossians says that it's written to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who were in Colossae. Grace and peace be from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ to you. So this passage was written to the church at Colossae. But he also wanted the neighboring church in the neighboring city of Laodicea to read it as well. Look at chapter 4, verse 16 in the book of Colossians. It says, now, when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, that you likewise read the epistle from, read the epistle from Laodicea. So not only was this passage we just read written to the church at Colossae, but it was also written to the church at Laodicea. Paul wanted both of them to read it. So the question is why? 
Why did he specifically say, I've, I've written this to Colossae, but I want Laodicea to read it as well? Well, Colossae was built uh, to, on a major trade route, and as a result of that, they were very influential in terms of commerce and, and business. As time passed, the city of Laodicea, which was next to them, it was founded and became actually in time an aggressive competitor to Colossae in terms of business. And so there was a natural rivalry between the cities. And that rivalry kind of began to seep into the churches. Listen, if we're not careful, we'll get into a little bit of a rivalry uh, where, where other churches are concerned. How many of you know we all have neighboring churches, and it's a blessing. I love other churches. I love other pastors, and you should as well. We should pray for them and support them, and, and we want to make sure that they are as successful as they can be uh, because they're actually doing exactly what we're doing. And so it's really, really important. One of the joys of my life in the last year or two is to be able to meet uh, new pastors, develop new friendships, have coffee with them, have lunch with them. And um, that's been a real joy, joy for me. And I, I, I'm invested in relationship to, to these churches. And, and we, we all should be. It's important that we don't get into rivalry with, with other churches. So um, this book of Colossians actually was written to remind us not to have a competitive spirit with fellow believers, but to be rooted in Christ, not in controversy, not in divisions. Now, I want to read Colossians 3, verses 12 through 14 in the Amplified, and then go through this list with you. <clears throat> Here in verse 12, it says, Clothe yourselves, therefore, as God's own chosen ones. He has picked representatives who are purified and holy and well-beloved by God himself. By putting on behavior marked by tender-hearted pity and mercy, kind feeling, a lowly opinion of yourselves, gentle ways, and patience which is tireless and long-suffering and has the power to endure whatever comes with good temper. Now, here in verse 12, uh, we, we start the list, and the first part of this list is compassion. Compassion. Put on, get dressed up, believers, in compassion. Now, it's talking about kingdom compassion, not not fleshly compassion. Really, compassion is an emotion. It's a powerful spiritual force, but it's an emotion. It, it's, a, it's a spiritual emotion that Jesus used. He was moved with compassion towards people. So it's a spiritual uh, em emotion. And so we are told, first of all, be compassionate. Let your emotions be moved spiritually towards one another and, and it, it's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. Then it goes on to say, the next on the list after compassion is to be kind or kindness. This word kindness in the Greek is krestos. It's where we get our, our English word crest, toothpaste from. No, not really. <laughs> just, just want to see if you're awake this morning. Um, how many of you, by the way, use crests? Colgate? Man, what, what do you brush your teeth with? I mean, um, I, my, I won't say which family. But one of my, my, my um, child and their spouse, they brush their teeth with black coals or something. I, I, some kind of healthy, natural thing. I don't know. 
Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not there. But anyway, krestos, you know what it means? You know what kindness means? From the Greek, it means moral goodness. You need to be morally good towards one another. And then from there, it goes to humility, lowliness of mind. This is on the list. Don't be full of yourself. And don't be so full of your opinion that it causes division with someone else. I mean, look, we're getting ready to have a, an election in our nation. Uh, and, um, you know, every presidential election is important. But let me just remind you of something. I know you know right now who you want to vote for more than likely. And so, um, I, 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 I mean, I don't know who you're going to vote for, but you probably know who you're going to vote for. And everyone who is in this place, I, I mean, I'm, I'm quite sure that not everybody's going to vote for the same person. So, here's what's important for us to remember as Christians, because we are believers in Jesus Christ, okay? Um, it, it's important that we don't get so full of ourselves and our opinion that we allow it to cause division in the house of God. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. All right, good. You can still vote for whoever you want to vote for. Well, let's not let division come into the house of God. This is on the list. Um, then from humility, we go to gentleness, which is the word praos, which actually means mild. And, and what it's saying when it saying, says be gentle to one another, it's saying be, be mild. Be, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 68 years old, and when I go to a restaurant, I no longer order food the way I did when I was 38 years old. I used to just throw it on, hot and spicy. I don't do that anymore. And the reason I don't is because I want to enjoy my meal all the way to the end. I, I, I don't want to take three bites and say, oh, my Lord, what have I done? I can't even enjoy this. I can't, I can't finish it. Be gentle with each other so that both of you can enjoy life. All the way to the end is what this list is saying. And then from there, we go to patience. I love the definition from Strong's Concordance of the word patience here. And that, that uh, word patient means this, the fortitude of forbearance. Don't you like that? The fortitude of forbearance. Turn to someone and say, I'm learning the fortitude of forbearance because of you. Better yet, say, say, thank you. Thank you for your fortitude of forbearance with me. All right. Be patient with people. You know what patience does? It chokes out division in the house. Be patient. And then we go uh, here in verse 13. Uh, uh, it, it speaks of being gracious. And the word gracious or graciousness speaks of showing favor. Lift people up, don't push them down. You know, there's no perfection in the house of God. Isn't that true? In sports, there is, uh, actually sportsmen live by a, a code of honor and that's to be sportsman-like or to show sportsmanship. Being gracious to your competitors. In life, graciousness is the code of honor we are to live by. Be gracious to each other. Anybody glad just for the simplicity of God's word this morning? Aren't you glad you can apply this to your life? Who needs to be a little more gracious with some of the people that are challenged to you in your life? Be gracious is what it's saying. And then we finally get to forgiveness, which means to pardon. It's what Jesus did for all of us isn't that important then that we offer the same to others? I don't think we have to say a whole lot more than that. Verse 14 says this, and above all these things, put on, get your clothes on, love and enfold yourselves with the bond of 
uh, perfectness, maturity, which binds everything together completely in ideal harmony. So um, as you put on all of these things that, on this list that we just read, you, you wrap yourself in the love of God, and the love of God is actually the perfect glue. It's the perfect bond of unity that the body of Christ needs. So get your clothes on. Get your clothes on. That's list number one. List number two, get your good deeds on. Get your good deeds on. Now, what we do in life matters. The things that we do will produce a positive or negative effect. The word deed means that which is done, good or bad. I want you right now to think about the deeds that you just have, that you did this past week. Some perhaps were good deeds, some perhaps were not necessarily good deeds. Whatever deed you did, it had an effect not just on you, but upon the people that are around you. Hence, the fact that we must make sure that the deeds we are doing are honoring God. And in honoring God, they honor the people God has put in our lives. I want, I want you to watch this. This is a good deed video. There is good news tonight about good deeds caught on those doorbell cameras and the moments of joy they inspire. When we think no one is watching, we found your wallet. Our truest selves are revealed. You just thought we would give it back to you. So. These kids in Colorado returning a wallet. This FedEx driver folding a customer's American flag correctly. FedEx worker Mel Marlette in Missouri caught on camera going above and beyond. Grab the shovel and like I've done many countless times before, started shoveling and I cleared the stoop up. Shoveling Jody Lafreniere's walkway. I think we're so eager to catch that person doing something wrong. We hardly ever catch anybody doing something right. There are, it turns out, so many people doing right like sanitation worker Billy Shelby, who spotted 88-year-old Opal fall in her driveway. And when she fell, of course, I jumped out the truck and uh, ran over there, and I could tell she was in distress. Since then, he's added a new duty to his route. Her daughter watches it unfold from her phone. I see the sanitation worker walking my mom up arm in arm. They were just having some great conversation. No one else had never done that, but he does, and he still does. I just knew I was doing the right thing. You know, uh, doing the right thing ain't hard to do. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Then there is this video. Two-year-old Cohen running, arms outstretched, toward pizza delivery man Ryan. I thought it was so funny that my toddler just ran out and hugged a stranger. His mother shared the video online. Ryan saw it and posted, this little guy has no idea how much I actually needed that this week. Upon going to his Facebook, that's when I saw the GoFundMe and that his daughter had recently passed, like within the last week. My heart absolutely breaks for the family. It, it just, I can't imagine what they're going through. A hug with an impact. So many little acts of kindness adding up and finally being seen. I learned that there are still good people in this world. You truly never know what people are going through, so always choose to be kind. Good people indeed. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our... You just never know, do you? The impact of a deed that is done. First Timothy chapter five, verse 10. Let's go to verse 10, first of all. It says, and it's well known, talking, this, this chapter is actually speaking to widows and to slaves in their place. Uh, and, and it says, um, speaking of a widow, that she is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the Lord's people, helping those in trouble, and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. And while this chapter is giving instruction to widows and, and to slaves, verse seven says this, give the people these instructions so that no one may be open to blame. Actually, other translation says, be sure you t let the church, the whole church, know about what I'm about to say. And here's the list in verse 10. 
First of all, be known for good deeds. Be known for good deeds. I just met someone a couple of weeks ago who was new to our church, and um, I, I asked, how did you get here? She introduced herself to me, and she essentially said this, well, I went to the city of Cala Mesa because they have a senior's um, food uh, thing there, a luncheon, and she said um, uh, they told her, you need to go to OV Church. Um, they'll help you with what you have need of. And um, I've heard that from more uh, than one person. And it, it reminds me that one of the things we're known for as a church is our good deeds. Amen. I mean, I was here yesterday morning uh, early and... and uh, um, you know, the place is just packed with cars everywhere, um, as it is every week. And we have a huge team out there and giving away a week's worth of groceries to everyone and anyone who needs them. And, I, you know, that's a good deed that we're known for. And sure, I am quite sure there are people who abuse good deeds and who, who uh, might try to take advantage of good deeds, but it should never stop Amen. our heart to do the right thing. Amen. Never. Be known for who you are, but also for what you do. Then this goes on in this list, not only be known for good deeds, but in this particular list, it says, and, and um, for bringing up children. Uh, I, Church, we have to embrace the next generation, don't we? I mean, e even this past week, I spent some time praying and just thinking about the next generation. And, and um, you know, I, uh, I, I was telling Joyce, I, I'm, you know, we've got children and we've, we've got young people and uh, everywhere, and, and I'm, I'm excited for the future. I'm, I'm, I'm excited for... Uh, the direction of the church and where it's going, but um, you know, I, I'm I'm getting a little long in the tooth. I'm 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 a little, you know, I'm I'm not 89. I'm not I'm not 88, but I am 68, and and the next generation's coming hard and fast. And um, you know, I I'm gonna have to step aside a little bit. And, and I'm, I'm going to have to watch them run. I'm going to have to watch them go. And I'm not sad about it. I'm excited for it. I'm so excited. I'm planning a sabbatical next year. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just excited about the next generation. The, one of the things on this list is, is bringing up children and Church, we've got to be praying for and sowing into the lives of the next generation. And I, I don't make any, any bones about the fact that the next generation is here. They're in place. They're hungry. They want to go. So let's let them go. Let's let them run. And they're going to make a lot of mistakes, just like you and I did. And they're, and they're going to do things that, that, you know, you and I might say, why would you do that? That's stupid. But we got to let them run. Flap your wings, soar. It's, it's time for the next generation. Uh, you you wanna, wanna do a good deed? Then, then encourage the next generation. And then from there, it goes to showing hospitality on this list. In the early days of Christianity, welcoming people, embracing people seemed to be an important characteristic of the church. We see in, in the book of Acts at the birth of the church, they had all things in common and they ate from house to house. They shared what they had with each other. Uh, it's very, very important that um, we, as the body of Christ, be hospitable. Uh, the actual Greek test, uh, text says, entertain strangers. Uh, that, and that can be done every Sunday before and after church. When it says entertain strangers, it's, it's not necessarily going out into the world and finding somebody and, and say, hey, hi, my name is, um, would you like to come over and have a meal with you? That's not necessarily what it's saying. What it is saying is this, 
and really this is set in the context of, of the family of God, the body of Christ. We need to connect with each other. We need to know each other after the flesh and after the spirit. We need to know what makes each other tick. We need to know why you and I are uh, the way that we are. And uh, that can be a challenge at times. But, but let, let's connect with each other. Let's share with each other. Now, look, I'm not looking for a, you know, a dinner invite to your house. That's not what I'm stumping for, and you're probably not going to get one in my house. What I am saying is this. I, I, didn't mean it. I didn't mean that to sound that way. Yeah. What I am saying is this. Every single week, you have opportunity. We have opportunity before and after services, in between, in the courtyard, to connect with somebody the original Greek text, to entertain strangers. I mean, there is no better place to, to, to make a stranger a friend than the house of God. Amen. And, and uh, you know, often what's easy and comfortable for all of us, um, come on now, Paul's just giving us some practical help here in terms of what uh, the church should, should look like. And, and when it comes to hospitality, he's saying this, connect with each other. And we can do that here. We can do that today. It's really comfortable to stay with the people you know, to stay connected just to the people you know. But to step out of that, um, uh, it's, it's very, very important. So hospitality is important. It's very important to the body of Christ. And then it goes on to talk about washing believers' feet, washing the feet of the Lord's people. We talked a little bit about this last week. I talked to you about my disdain for foot washing service. I have not scheduled one. Um, uh, somebody came to me and says, I have a small group. I think we're going to do foot washing. I said, great. I think I'm out of town that week, but it's going to be great for you guys. Enjoy. Um, but really, when it talks about here washing believers' feet, which is on the list, it, it, when you look at the, the original language, what it's talking about is to cleanse those who are set apart. Cleanse those who are set apart. We often will give more grace to the world than we will to the body of Christ. We'll be, be more compassionate to people who don't know the Lord than people who do. And we're being reminded in this list that we are to not forget to wash believers' feet. Um, by the way, we are all God's children, and so you and I are brothers and sisters. I, I remember Joyce telling our children when they were growing up, uh, they'd, they'd been fighting or something, and, and she would tell our children, you guys need to be each other's best friends because the friends you have at school, the friends you have on your ball team, those are seasonal friends for the most part. They're going to come and go all your life. You may have one or two that'll stick, but they're seasonal friends. But you will always be brother and sister with each other. You will always spend your life with brother and sister. And so it is important for us as brothers and sisters in the Lord to recognize, hey, we are with each other for eternity. That's a long time. And so um, we better fall in love with each other. Amen. Then do good deeds for those who are in trouble. In trouble, next on the list, in trouble. Um, we all fall into distress from time to time. Uh, we need a hand up. It, it's an important deed that we can do. Um, I, I will tell you that um, you know a few weeks ago I um, just had a challenging week and and um, uh, how many of you you know get discouraged from time to time? You know I just had a little moment where I was a little bit discouraged. You know, anybody ever feel sorry for themselves once in a while? Yeah, yeah, of course. Woe is me. We all do and. I just had that little moment just kind of flashed into my life. And, and uh, um, uh, I, I came to prayer a couple weeks ago in a, uh, in, during the morning. And, 
and uh, it just seemed like they wanted to pray for me. People were here, and uh, so they were praying for me. And so I thought, okay, this is good, you know, because I'm feeling a little bit down, a little bit, a little bit sorry for myself, you know. Had a rough week, and and um, you know, all of a sudden, um, you know, they continued to pray for me. Um, in in a group, I, you know, I don't want people to pray for me most of the time. I I like to pray for people. Um, I don't want to be the center of attention. Um, but I know that sounds odd coming from somebody who's standing in front of you and is the center of attention right now. But um, uh, And they prayed for me. And, and as they prayed for me, um, the, some of them started to say some things about me that, you know, kind of really encouraged me and helped me. And, um, and I realized later, you know, they, they're just giving me a hand up. They didn't even know it. But they're just pulling me up back to, to where I need to be. We all fall into distress and trouble. So let's devote ourselves to all kinds of good deeds, especially when it comes to people in the house of God. Last thing, we're done. Number three, last list, the short list, remind yourself. Remind yourself. Now, this past week, I was invited to a barbershop Bible study, very early Christian-esque um, and the man who taught the Bible study in this barber shop, it's like 20 guys there and real early in the morning and, and I, I get there, it's in Redlands and um, I walk in and there's, there's a, you know, all the seats are filled with people, the barber shop seats and they have other chairs in there and, and uh, it's seven o'clock in the morning and, and um, it was just, it was a great, great time. Um, and, and while we're having this Bible study, we just filled the whole little barber shop. People would come in for haircuts and we kept having the Bible study and somebody's getting their haircut. I mean, I was sitting next to a barber chair and a guy's getting his haircut while the word's being taught and his little hair is getting on my, you know, and, and uh, I'm, I mean, anyways, you know, it was very interesting. But it's also so powerful so powerful. And the man who invited me to come is actually new to our church. And, and uh, he taught a great, great uh, lesson. And, and his teaching included a list. He didn't call it that. That reminded me of the struggles that we all face and the hope of overcoming them. And so I'm going to use that list. And it's found in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. It says, moreover, let us also be full of joy now. Let us exult and triumph in our troubles and rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that the pressure and affliction and hardship, they all produce patient and unswerving endurance. The very first thing on this list is suffering and trouble and pressure and hardship. How many of you are excited about that first thing on the list? We all suffer, we all have trouble, we all are under pressure, and we all endure hardship. Who hasn't been there? While in it, we must show unswerving endurance, which is next on the list. We must endure. A good Bible definition of endurance, you've heard me say it before, is to bear up courageously. To bear up underneath the hardship and the pressure and the affliction and the suffering that you are experiencing. In other words, get through it even when you're in it. And if you can withstand the suffering and the hardship and the pressure with unswerving endurance, then something will pop up on this list that you get to move into next. And that's found, let's go to verse four. And endurance, fortitude, develops the, here's what's next on the list, the maturity of character. Character. Trouble, distress, pressure, hardship. If you endure it, bear up courageously. Nobody likes it, but if you endure it, bear up courageously, then you build your character. Your character gets built. The maturity of your character grows. And the Bible says character of this sort produces the habit of joyful and confident, this is the last thing on the list, hope. Hope. Hope is a spiritual force and a state of mind. 
Hope is the confident expectation and assurance that it's well with your soul, despite what you're experiencing and going through. Hope is a mindset, an attitude. It's a perspective. Hope is how God designed us to live while we're going through trouble, pressure, trial, tribulation, difficulty. Hope is what God has designed us to live with so that we can endure what we're experiencing. And the reason we can is because we have hope. I told you maybe a month ago in a message, um, my, my greatest picture of hope is Christmas morning when all my grandkids come to, to the house and they all, one by one, the families come in the morning. They've already had their own family celebrations and they come to Nan and Poppy's house and we have our Christmas tree up and I, I don't care what anybody thinks. I mean, I'm gonna buy as many gifts for each of them as I can. And if you know what, if you don't like that, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna do a Joyce shops for all the grandkids and she'll buy each of them two or three gifts. And once she's done doing that, and I don't tell her, but I'm going to the toy store <laughs> and I'm gonna buy a couple more for each of them. And, and what, what I love about Christmas morning, and we, of course we read the Bible story and we pray and we eat together and all that. But I love the hope that I see in all of my grandchildren when they walk in and they see that mountain of presence that goes up halfway up where the tree is and fills the whole corner of our family room. I love the look on their face. And they start wading in looking for packages that have their name on it. They have a confident expectation of something really good. Now, they can't open them yet, but, but they're, they are so filled with excitement and joy because they know what's coming. It's going to bless them. And, and um, when it's time to open gifts, they are beside themselves. I mean, it's just to watch what's going on in their little lives is worth every penny. Now, for those of you who are thinking, well, there are a lot of kids in the world who don't get any gifts. Joyce and I, I don't even need to tell you this, but Joyce and I, we, we buy gifts for kids who are less fortunate. Uh, we, we support monthly children all over the world. I don't need to tell you all that stuff, but I'm just telling you, I'm not gonna back down from buying my grandkids. You know what I love? They teach me the, what the spirit of hope is. They're so excited and filled with Joy, the habit of joyful and confident hope. And so um, what we need to do in the body of Christ, the family of God, is to make sure that as we go through the stuff we go through, that we endure, bear up courageously, knowing it's going to build our character. Everybody wants character, but nobody wants trouble and distress to get it. Nobody wants to endure to get it, but we're going to because we have a confident expectation that ought to produce joy in us despite what we're going through, and it's called hope because we know that God has, has something outside and beyond what we're experiencing. And so um, trouble, endure it. It'll build character, and the way you live through all of that is with hope. We have hope, which is, is going to get us through. All right, that's all I have time for this morning, those three lists. Um, you ought to go back over and see, how can I apply these things on these lists for me in my life? Let's stand together. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the opportunity we've had to approach your word. Uh, what a privilege and honor it is just to receive this morning some vegetables that we can eat, bring strength into our life, produce godliness. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name for the living word of truth. What a privilege and joy and honor it is to put on the godly clothing, the godly clothing that, that is compassionate and kind and, 
and humble and gentle and patient and gracious, offering forgiveness, allowing us to move into love. Thank you, Father, for, for, for the good deeds that we're able to exhibit in our lives as believers, to be known for good deeds, not only as a church, but as individuals, as families, for bringing up the next generation, Lord, to show hospitality towards those we don't know, to wash each other's feet, to cleanse those that are set apart, to, good, to do good deeds, Father, where, where there is trouble in people's lives as we devote ourselves to all kinds of good deeds. We thank you, Lord. We have the privilege during suffering and trouble and pressure and hardship to endure, to bear up courageously that our character is built. And we're able to build that character for your use because we live with the hope we find in Christ. We honor and bless you this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Close your eyes for just a moment before we go. If you are here, if you're watching us in our online church service and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, today is your day. Today is the day of salvation, Scripture declares. Listen, God created you. He put within you a personality, put within you gifts. He put within you callings. God knows exactly what you are supposed to accomplish on the earth, who you are supposed to be. He knows the people you're supposed to meet. He knows the people that you're to connect with in life, perhaps people you don't even know yet yourself. God has a plan for you, and that plan starts with making sure that you are right with the one who created you. See, God so loves you that even when you sin, and sin separates man from God, even when we lived a life apart from God, God loves us so much that he sent his one and only son to die a cruel death on the cross so that his shed blood through the crown of thorns that lacerated his forehead, through the whip that, that shredded his back, through the piercing of his side with the sword and the spear. His shed blood has the power and ability to cover our sin that we might live the life he's called us to. And all it takes is for you and I to make a decision. That's the starting place to make Jesus Lord and Savior of our lives. I want to pray with you today. If you're here in-house or watching in this first service and you've never made Jesus Lord and Savior or you've served him in the past, you're away from him today and you want to come back home, you want to get right with God and you want me to pray with you, I want you right now, quickly, to lift your hand. Hold it up high and wave it at me until I acknowledge you. Pastor, it's me. I need Jesus. Pastor, it's me. I need to get right with God. Who's here? Who's here in house? You would say, Pastor, pray for me. I need the Lord. Anyone? Anyone at all? At home? Watching? Wherever you're at? Whatever device you're watching on? I need Jesus. I need to get right with the Lord. All right. Let, let's pray this prayer together. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me, forgiving me. And today, at my invitation, be the Lord of my life. I believe that you are the Son of God. You died on the cross, rose again, and today, come to live in my life as Lord and Savior. And from this day on, I will serve you all the days of my life. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.